All right. Wow. Lightning talks. Really, really fantastic. Really, really fast. And now you barely have time to catch your breath because next up, we have Darren Gray, host of Roguelike Radio, community busybody, developer of many small roguelikes, including Broken Bottle, Fire Tail, The Trapped Heart, and Time to Die. And he has a baby with him. Hello. Yes, I've got a little rogue with me, uh, just in case I need help during my talk with extra vomit. My happen. All right. Uh, Take it away. So, yes, uh, those are some great talks, weren't they? Right. What is a roguelike is what I want to talk about. Not the age-old argument of what is a roguelike, no, but what is a rogue like? The, the word rogue uh, has lots of associations. We, of course, associate it with our fantastic genre, but it has more associations than that. And importantly, what do those associations mean for our genre? How like rogues do we want our roguelikes to be like? Something like that. So, for example, rogues are not rouge, okay? So a rogue will not typically stop to ensure that they are looking fantastic before they kick someone in the nuts, right? So, and in this way, we see this reflected in the genre because the ASCII aesthetic that is dominant in the early stage of the genre uh, is not particularly rouge. You can pretty it up a little bit like brogue, but ultimately the utilitarianism of the gameplay is more important than the looks. So in this way, roguelikes are like rogues and not rouge. Okay, hopefully you vaguely understand that. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about etymology and definitions of the word rogue itself. Um, looking at the place uh, that rogues have in our culture and some of the different connotations of that. Then looking at the game rogue itself and how it adopts some of those connotations and cultural elements. And then going on to how that affects our design, in particular, something I call the hero trap and how we can design our roguelikes for rogues, how we can embed the very idealism of rogueness into our roguelikes. Right, so let's get started. Firstly, a wall of text. The definition of the word rogue, so there's two main definitions. The first one is a dishonest or unprincipled man. Well, that's straight away sexist, so I don't agree with that. Um, and with a, a subtext of a person whose behavior one disapproves of, but is nonetheless likable or attractive. Okay, that sounds better. So we've got this idea that's uh, like a, a villain, a reprobate, a rascal, and yet also, oh, impish, uh, scampish, it's sort of a mischief maker. So we have these ideas embedded within the rogue that it's wrong, but we sort of like it too. Um, the second major definition is an elephant or other large wild animal living apart from that. What on earth does this mean? Wow, this is about this, comes from the idea of a rogue elephant, and we'll get into the history of that in just a second. But it's something that is aberrant, it's unpredictable, separate from the rest, okay? So a rogue is somehow different from the norm, not part of the herd, not part of the crowd. And we'll look a little bit more like that, uh, a little bit more at that as we go on. Right, that's, that's the modern definition. It's important to look at the, the history of this. So it comes from the 1950s, from an idle vagrant, more wall of text here. Um, perhaps a shortened form of rogger, thieves slang for a begging vagabond who pretends to be a poor scholar from Oxford or Cambridge. I didn't expect the history of the word rogue to come from Oxford graduates or pretend Oxford graduates, um, but it's coming potentially from the Latin rogare to ask. Mm. Uh, another theory traces it back to the Celtic rog meaning haughty, um, it, but it seems to be mostly this first one with uh, its associations with vagabonds. So straight away we've got outcasts who are doing something slightly wrong and yet somehow we end up kind of pitying them or, or rooting for them in some way. Um, from the 1590s it evolved into something playful or affectionate as one who is mischievous. Okay, So there, there came to be this uh, affection for the idea of a rogue. Uh, and then in the 1800s it came to mean a large wheel, a large beast uh, a wild beast living apart from the herb, originally of elephants. So the idea of rogue elephants comes from the, the 1850s originally, but the idea is that you've got a single elephant behaving in a rogue manner. Uh, and we see the connotations of that word actually in a lot of the ways we apply rogue these days. Um, and then from the 60s onwards, uh, something uncontrolled or undisciplined. Ooh, I like that, lacking discipline. Um, and we also have this idea of the rogues gallery, and this goes back uh, again to the, the 17th uh, or, or 18th century, or is it 19th? I actually can't tell what that is saying, 
But the idea is that you have a rogues gallery, which is a pleated collection of mugshots. So you've got a lineup of these are the different rogues, which is the rogue that you particularly like. Um, yeah, so those are some of the ideas of what makes up the word rogue. And importantly, we can think about how that affects how the rogues in our games are presented and what way uh, our main characters or the, the whole theme of the game is somehow representing this, this core concept of a rogue. But those, those are literal definitions. Um, words can have a little bit more meaning than their literal definitions. Uh, they've got all sorts of cultural connotations. So I want to investigate a few of the ideas of rogues in culture. Um, now, we have the idea, for instance, of the Grey Mouser, who was a big inspiration for Dungeons and Dragons, uh, a roguish hero who gets into various different types of troubles and, and uses various tricks to get out of them. Um, we have the idea of rogue AI. So this is a term that comes from that kind of idea of a rogue elephant, what we see in System Shock, in, in HAL 9000, and all these different ideas of an AI that has somehow gone rogue, meaning it's not obeying us anymore. It's doing its own thing, and that is a threat. Um, you also have charismatic creatures like the the Joker, who's a, a heavily loved villain in the Batman universe. And importantly, he's a villain who uses tricks, uses chicanery, uses intelligence to get around the much more brawny and resourced Batman. Um, so we have this idea of the, the rogue here being somewhat of a, an underdog and being someone who, although he's a villain, we, we quite like him. Um, North Korea is a rogue state. Uh, it's important to think about the connotations of that. Again, there's that idea of it being separate from the herd, not part of the pack, but also there's a, there's a threat there, right? There's a sense of, although it may not be the most powerful nation on earth, its chaotic way of behaving is a threat to us all. Um, rogue in X-Men uh, is an interesting character because sh her special powers are different from all the other types of special powers in the, the comic. Uh, she has a special power whereby if she touches someone, she gains their power, right? So it's a kind of meta power in a way. And that makes her very different. And this also has a physical effect on her in that she can't touch people, which makes her physically distanced as well as sort of a, uh, conceptually distant from the other people. So again, there's this that idea of isolation and separatism inherent in, in that idea of the character Rogue. And... Sarah Palin had an autobiography called Going Rogue. I, I must admit, I haven't read it. I haven't done all my research for this presentation. Huh. Um, but I imagine what she's doing is channeling the idea of separatism and uniqueness and being uniquely driven or having a voice which is different from the rest of the pack. Uh, and it speaks certainly to certain um, right-wing ideals in America, especially kind of cultural ideals that you'll find among certain right-wing circles. But it also speaks to a, a, a stronger kind of American ideal, the idea of the Wild West, the cowboy, the Clint Eastwood, uh, the American exceptionalism, American individualism, uh, which so affects American culture and American foreign policy and all sorts of different things. Uh, so we see all these ideas embedded into what a, a rogue is. Um, and of course, the one cultural uh, pillar of rogueness that I haven't discussed is Dungeons and Dragons. And that is really the primary inspiration behind the game Rogue itself, as well as a lot of our ideas about rogues in games, okay? Now, the original Dungeons and Dragons, it should be noted, did not have a rogue character. It was added as a, um, a sort of a, an add-on, a DLC, as it were. In those days, you got DLCs by buying pieces of paper at a conference. Um, so, uh, the thief class, when originally added, was uh, was a class that uh, had lower number of hit points than a normal character, that could backstab, could engage in stealth, could detect traps, could make use of magical items in ways that normal characters couldn't as well, by reading scrolls which were normally set for wizards. Uh, so there's all sorts of different ways in which it was set apart. Yet also there was this inherent idea that it was weaker, okay, and it had to rely on tricks on intelligence, potentially on charisma. And that evolved into a whole, a whole rogue class, which includes things like bards and, and other, uh, other types of uh, player character, uh, which all split off into different splinters of this idea of what a rogue means. So going to the game Rogue, 40 years old this year, I think that's a, a really important thing to celebrate. Um, rogue 
And it should be noted it's called Rogue. Uh, <laughs> I, that maybe seems obvious, but you know it could easily have been called something else, right? And we could easily be talking about a completely different genre name right now if it had been called something else. Uh, disappointingly, when Glenn Wickman was asked on our podcast why uh, it was called Rogue, his answer was because the word is short, so it's quick to type into Unix terminals. That uh, that's quite a disappointing answer, Glenn. You got to do better than that. Come on, invent some sort of mythology around it. It came to you in a dream or something, you know. But okay, so that's that's his literal reason for it. I don't believe him though, because as I've been talking, rogues are part of our culture. We don't use these words lightly. Okay, he could have called the game hero, and that would have been less characters. So I think there was some subconscious thing about this, the cultural implications of the word rogue that entered into their minds when they designed this game. Because it isn't just called rogue, it has roguish elements to its game design. Okay, So we've got a game where you start very weak. Okay, You're, you're, you're not a strong character. You're not a big, muscly, heroic character. You're surrounded by unknowns. It's got the item identification system. It's got the, the line of sight system. It's got the procedural generation system all of which add to this aspect of you're surrounded by unknown threats. Uh, it's got a pressure system. You would have heard uh, Rosalind talk earlier about hunger systems and pressure systems in rogue mics. They come from rogue, okay? It, it had a hunger system, a hunger clock, which meant that you were never safe, right? You couldn't just stand still uh, and rest up whenever you liked. There was a continuous pressure and quite a strong pressure in many versions of the game to keep advancing, otherwise you will starve to death. <laughs> And what, like, what an unheroic way to die, okay? <laughs> what a roguish way to die. You might be clutching some powerful item, but you starve to death in the end. Um, so th there's an element of you can die quite pathetically in this game if you don't take it seriously. Um, threat, there's the idea of this threat in the game, and it's an escalating threat. It keeps getting uh, harder. Um, but also opportunities for ingenuity. And this, to me comes to the real heart of what a rogue is about. Because you have all these things making it not particularly easy for you, but you have your different items, your abilities and opportunities, which if used in clever ways, can get you out of the situation. Uh, so rogue is wonderful for giving you lots of opportunities to find clever solutions to different problems. And you can think through them, and the problems are always new and exciting and invigorating, uh, and you can feel really special and really roguish when you solve them. Now, uh, I have noted in the, uh, there was a sort of a, what was it called? The preview event uh, that Rogue came with a few different covers and there's, some of them give different ideas of what the game is really about. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into as much detail, but do check out the, the preview event for more analysis of these two images and why the one on the left is so wrong for this game whilst the one on the right gets a little bit more representative of what the gameplay is about. Uh, but importantly, I'm just showing this as a segue into the idea of the hero trap. So there is a concept that when a new player comes to play a roguelike, uh, when they haven't really encountered the genre before, they fall into the hero trap. Um, an example of this is from FTL where there's an event called the giant alien spiders event and by default you have two options right you're being told a station has been overrun by giant alien spiders and the first option is send the crew to help giant alien spiders are no joke the second option is no thanks leave them alone experienced fdl players will know which is the correct option to choose in this instance um, it is not the heroic option okay if you come from another game, like a, like another standard RPG, where you just say yes to every quest, you by default choose the heroic option, um, you will die a lot in roguelikes. Okay? And this particular event is an example of a hero trap, because people coming to roguelikes expecting to be the hero suddenly find that being a hero is not the way to survive. Um, so I'll go into this in a lot more depth in uh, a roguelike radio episode about quite specifically this topic. Uh, but I want to briefly touch on the fact that, you know, we are talking about games that are about rogues and not about heroes. And it's important for us to be able to differentiate those ideas. So 
heroes versus rogues. The, the hero typically uh, has a noble cause, whilst the rogue in a lot of fiction will be involved for self-interest. They'll be wanting to win gold or rescue an amulet uh, for their own personal gain. Uh, the hero often is a defender of the establishment, you know, on a quest from the king or something like that. Whilst the rogue is a rebel, uh, typically doing something that goes against some sort of evil empire. Uh, the hero might be inspired by destiny on, on a divine quest. Uh, whilst the rogue is often accidentally involved, if not involved just purely for their own self-gain. And we see this in roguelikes, of course. You know, How on earth can you be the one true destiny person when you are number one? 1,048 of players killed by the, oh, it just uh, this month alone. So, you know, the idea of a Destiny of Divine quest, a heroic quest, doesn't gel well with a roguelike theme of game. Um, heroes have big swords, rogues, small daggers. It's not the size that matters, it's what you do with it that counts. Uh, heroes are brave, rogues are cautious, if not actively running away. Uh, hero will try and intimidate an enemy, whilst the rogue will quite literally run away at the sign of overwhelming danger. Uh, a hero will engage in a, uh, a duel, you know, an honorable duel, whilst the hero will sneak up, or the rogue will sneak up and backstab. You know, uh, there's no room for, for honor in the rogue, um, especially if there's some advantage to be had in ignoring that. Um, the hero might win by the power of love and friendship and all that sort of thing. The, hero, the, rogue, the rogue will win by craftiness and intelligence and, and coming up with clever ways to get out of things. Uh, at the end of the quest, the hero will refuse the reward, the reward that's on offer, whilst the, ho the rogue will steal whatever valuables are not nailed down. And the hero might win the princess at the end of the quest, whilst the rogue typically is associated with seducing the princess. So those are some ideas of how heroes and rogues are different. Um, but let's dive in in a little bit more depth about designing for the very idea of a rogue. So not just in comparison with heroes, but things that are intrinsic to rogues. Um, so firstly, the, first, the main thing to consider is your theme, right? If you're making a roguelike game and your theme is a big muscly warrior, all your, your artwork and all your, your names are emphasizing the idea of a heroic character, then you're probably not presenting well the idea that this is a roguelike. You're not setting up the player very well to anticipate the type of gameplay they're going to encounter. Uh, whereas instead, if your theme emphasizes the threat, uh, emphasizes the challenge, um, emphasizes the danger, then that better uh, incorporates the idea that, that it is a rogue they're playing. But also the theme should consider the rogue as a as sort of tricky individual as a where intelligence is the way to get through um so in, just in terms of the way your main character is presented the way in which uh if there is a story how it enforces how that character got involved there's lots of different ways you can layer on the theme the idea that it's a rogue you're playing um and that we can uh and that the player should be expecting to play in a roguish fashion right uh, importantly, you know, a lot of that upfront really reinforces the idea of how the player should be approaching your game. Um, you'll have seen the talk earlier by Andrew Aversa on uh, Permadeath and all the different reviews of like, oh, how the Permadeath is so terrible and stuff. You know, a lot of that is so much down to the framing. If people don't understand uh, the, the style of game it is or what's expected of them in playing it, then they will approach it like a standard RPG and not quite get the behavior they're supposed to do. Um, especially when you consider, you know, a lot of the trappings that we have in roguelikes, a lot of the game mechanics we have about like, detecting traps, for instance, or, or status effects, often they're just like little optional side extras in a standard RPG, whereas they end up becoming core required features for you to really take advantage of in a roguelike. Um, so it's important to separate out your game in that way. Um, reinforcing running away is something that is difficult to do, but important. Um, and in particular, there's there's the idea when you're playing a roguelike that you suddenly realize this is a bad situation, right? Uh, and you have to get away. So, I mean, firstly, a game needs to give the player escape options. Running away is a core part of being a rogue. The idea of regrouping or of even just avoiding that fight. You don't need to kill that thing to progress. You can run away to the stairs, go down to the next level. Hopefully, that we can get around it in future as well. 
Um, so you can have monsters that are literally impossible to kill, for instance. Uh, you have to run away. And that teaches the player, there's, there's no getting around this. If you keep trying to attack this thing, you will just keep dying. Um, but giving escape options, giving a way of getting away easily, and inserting the right warnings in the game. So inserting the right mental breaks. So you stop going from the heroic charge mental attitude to the, oh dear, I need to reevaluate my options here, uh, mental state. Um, some games do this with warning signs, flashing, uh, you know, flashing the screen red, things like that. There's various ways to reinforce you're in danger, rethink what you're doing. Um, signaling threats, so making sure that you know your game isn't just full of lots of creatures that look all cuddly but are actually quite terrifying. Um, so even down to the the dungeon design, um, you know there's various games where you enter a, a really difficult level and you'll get you get a special threat message or the walls will be a different color, um, and that the enemies you know an enemy boss is a special color or is specially highlighted in some way, ensuring that the player has the option of knowing. These are the real things I need to care about. Um, hard choices. So making sure that the player doesn't always just have press X to win. Okay, that, um, so things like inventory limits force them to assess the value of different items uh, that they have to carry. Um, or, or lots of other things where you have to make a choice between X and Y, and it's really not an easy choice. Okay, so never make it so that upgrading your sword is always really obvious. That one's plus one, but this one's plus two. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got a hard choice of whether to continue this uh, talk right now. Here we go. I'm going to uh, give her a little potion. There we go. All fine. Um, opportunities to feel clever is the really important thing. Uh, so making sure that, uh, that there are the different items, the different systems in there, for the player to be able to combine in an interesting way uh, so that they're not just doing an obvious thing all the time. They can find interesting ways out of what look like on the surface impossible or very difficult scenarios. Uh, so making sure those options are there, making sure those options are clear. Okay. Uh, sometimes I think uh, some of the bigger games fill the game with so much junk that you forget what's important or what's clever. Um, so making sure that you can signal that to the player is very important. And lastly, making the player different from the enemies. Um, there's this old notion that, the, that a player is a monster in roguelike design. And that's more about how the player is integrated into the environment. So like if a bomb goes off, it affects you just in the same way you affect the enemy. But I think it's quite important in the mechanics that your player functions in a different way from the other entities in the game to signal that idea of separatism, being different from the herd. Uh, so. An example of all these different things is a screenshot there of uh, a game I made once called Toby the Trapper. It was a little seven-day roguelike I made. Um, in this, you play a gnome facing an army of goblins. Oh, no, sorry, facing an army of ogres. Okay, You cannot attack the ogres directly, um, and they can kill you in one hit. So this thematically is showing that, that you're facing powerful things, and the idea of running away is intrinsic to the game because you cannot attack them head on. Um, the game, you can only harm enemies by laying traps, right? That's the only thing you can do, but there's various different clever traps that you can chain together in interesting ways to hit them in interesting effects. Um, and you have double the movement speed of every enemy. Um, so you are always able to run away. Uh, so you can be in a position where you're always feeling threatened. You're surrounded by monsters, yet you know if you move cleverly or you lay your traps cleverly, there's ways of getting around them um, and helping you feel just a little bit more like a rogue. So these are some ideas. There's lots of other ideas out there. Um, I think we should think more about the word rogue and what it really means to us and how we make our players feel like rogues or potentially feel like Sarah Palin. Uh, thank you. Very happy to take any questions and I'll probably hang around at the at symbol statue at the next break. What a, what a way to end it, and fantastic baby charming there. There was a lot of discussion about babies being ideal rogues for multiple <laughs> reasons. Uh, and let's take a look at questions. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to decide if all of these are based on this one or if we cleared the ones before. Um, there is one point from Dustin Freeman that there's something wonderful about being accused of being a rogue as someone with a British accent. Could you do that? 
Uh, I'm Irish. So yeah. Who are you? Sorry. Uh -huh. That's a good answer. <laughs> now, I have lived in England for quite a long time, so I do have a British accent, yes. Um, there is a question of, well, I don't think these got cleared is why I'm trying to figure out. Everyone, add questions for Darren here. I think we've got questions from the uh, lightning talk still, unless you want to talk about local minima and maxima, Darren. <laughs> I'm not qualified for that. No, those lightning talks were amazing, though. Yes. Yeah. There was one point, if giant alien spiders were a joke, what joke would they be? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the, the joke there is that they're a trap, right? That The joke is, in fact, that the heroic option is giant alien spiders are no joke. And the truth is, they aren't a joke. So it should be, I'm going away because giant alien spiders are no joke. So it, it's quite cleverly written in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, here's a, a question for you. <laughs> what are some good implementations of the feeling of being a rogue? Um, a game that so, you feel is most rogue-like. Yeah, I mean, rogue is, is very good at it because it's got lots of opportunities for um, being powerful without feeling powerful. So various of its items uh, let you manipulate you know, the way monsters move or, or different things like that which, uh, you know, you can end up making a monster walk into lava, for instance, and that, that makes you feel clever. You can set a field on fire and then run away or set a, a, a caustic gas trap off. So you're manipulating things that are essentially sort of external power sources to yourself, uh, whilst you yourself remain quite weak. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. Um, here's another question. What would you think would be the implication if roguelikes were called something like dungeon crawlers or such, if the original game wasn't called rogue? What would that alternate history perhaps look like? Uh, probably just the same, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, let's face it, most, a lot of the big roguelikes don't don't think too much about this. They implement some of the, the rogue mechanics quite blindly. So the hunger clock got discussed before. Um, you know, you look at Nehack and, you aid, and Adom, and you think, why do they bother including hunger apart from the fact that rogue at it. Um, so I think some games quite cleverly approach it, but um, some games just are dungeon crawlers. We actually have a, a hot tip. Slashy says that he just got a message from Glenn that says there was the aspect that you were a rogue in the sense of being on your own and not part of a team since it was a single player ah. game. Okay. Well, he didn't yeah. say that in our interview, <laughs> uh, but I'm glad to hear that because I do think that that has actually a big effect on roguelikes. And there was a talk earlier about um, squad-based games. And you know, a key thing in Rogue is that you can move quite quickly whenever you want to. And then when things get hairy, you can stop and really take your time and think and make sure you're making the right action. And in the squad-based game, you don't really get to do that in quite the same way. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. There's also a, a good point here from Fentos of, isn't there something inherently un like about pacifism? Which brings up an interesting question in terms of at least conducts to me. Um, well, if everyone else is a killer and you're not, then that's pretty rogue. <laughs> I guess that's true. Being a um, uh, if you're finding contrarian. really clever ways to sort of uh, disable things and, and you know tricking things into not attacking, then that's pretty rogue, I think. Yeah. No, that's a good point. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, especially at a relatively late hour and with the baby adventure that thankfully was satisfied by a potion. Uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, dropping thank you by. Very much. Cheers. Bye.